Hill today. Right now we're looking at Congressman Chris Shays, Republican in Connecticut, who's going to be chairing this hearing of the House Government Reform Subcommittee on National Security. They're looking at U.N. sanctions after the Oil for Food program. They're asking the question, is it still a viable diplomatic tool? Panel 1 features John Bolton, the U.S. Ambassador. There'll be a Panel 2. This should run at least a couple of hours. Live coverage. Enjoy your day. Quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats, and International Relations hearing entitled UN Sanctions After Oil for Food, Still a Viable Diplomatic Tool, is called to order. I should have said that with a question. Still a viable diplomatic tool? There is no guarantee United Nations management reforms will ensure future sanctions succeed, but the lack of management reforms will certainly guarantee they fail. UN Security Council Resolution 661 imposed comprehensive sanctions on Iraq after the 1990 invasion of Kuwait. Over the next four years, proposals to ease rather than enforce the sanctions dominated deliberations of the 661 Committee composed of all permanent and rotating Security Council members. From its inception in 1996, the United Nations Oil for Food program was susceptible to political manipulation and financial corruption. The program lacked UN United Nations oversight and accountability and trusted Saddam Hussein with sovereign control over billions of dollars of oil sales and commodity purchases. This situation, of course, invited illicit premiums, kickbacks, and other forms of corruption. How was a well-intentioned program designed and administered by the world's preeminent multinational organization so systematically and thoroughly pillaged? The answers emerging from investigations by the Volcker Commission, the Government Accountability Office, and from this committee and other congressional committees point to a debilitating combination of political paralysis and a lack of oversight that metastasized behind a veil of official secrecy. Two years ago, this subcommittee first heard how Saddam Hussein's regime manipulated the Oil for Food program. Our second hearing addressed pro problems the Oil for Food contract inspectors faced in dealing with both Hussein regime and the United Nations. The third dealt with internal deliberations at the UN and willful ignorance of the Security Council members towards the corruption taking place. At today's hearing, we will consider implications of this scandal for future UN sanctions. In the wake of the Oil for Food program scandal, we ask how can the UN be expected to properly administer future sanctions against states such as Sudan or Iran, which commit vicious crimes against their own people and threaten international peace and stability. Sanctions are essential measures used to maintain or restore international peace and security. Sanctions are an alternative to armed conflict. The penalty or price applied to a state must outweigh the advantages of wrongful behavior and lead the target state to rescind its behavior. No sanction program is effective unless its objectives are widely shared and supported among key UN member states. And we have learned from the oil for food scandal, oversight of any sanctioned program is absolutely essential. The GAO noted 
the UN Office of Internal Oversight Services, the Inspector General of the UN, must be an independent operation and autonomous. Aggressive independent oversight ferrets out waste, abuse, and fraud in huge bureaucracies. It uncovers illicit activities. Secretary General Kofi Annan, in March of this year, issued a report setting out sweeping administrative reforms. If these reforms fail in the face of opposition, the UN is vulnerable to continued scandal. If implemented, these and other reforms will lend credibility to the United Nations and its ability to enforce a sanctions regime. We are joined today by our permanent representative to the United Nations, Ambassador John Bolton, who will share his views on pros prospects for UN management reforms. We are eager to hear his views about how sanctions work, worked in Iraq and how they will work in the future, particularly in confronting the genocide in Sudan and deterring Iran's nuclear program. On our second panel, the Government Accountability Office, a former UN diplomat and an advisor to the UN, will provide their perspectives and recommendations. We look forward to all their testimony. I'll just again say, Mr. Bolton, it is an honor to have you here. Uh, and I'm going to call on the other members for their statements. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I want to acknowledge the uh, uh, presence of our ranking Democrat for the full subcommittee, Henry Waxman, and thank him for the uh, cooperation and honor that he's given me of being the ranking member of this subcommittee. Uh, welcome, Mr. Bolton. Uh, as you know, a few days ago, the Congress of the United States passed a H.R. Uh, uh, 282, the Iran Freedom Support Act, which uh, essentially articulated a structure of sanctions uh, to be imposed on Iran. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask that this be submitted in the record as part of the presentation that I'm making. That objection so ordered? We're at a critical moment for U.S. policy at the U.N., particularly regarding Iran. Just last Friday marked the Security Council's deadline for Iran to freeze all nuclear fuel enrichment and the beginning of an inevitable struggle at the Security Council over what to do to contain Iran's nuclear ambitions. We've seen this kind of struggle at the Security Council before. The U.S. spent much time in 2002 pressuring the Security Council to take action against Iraq to contain its supposed weapons of mass destruction. Finally, on November 8, 2002, the Council approved Resolution 1441, which imposed tough new arms inspections in Iraq and promised serious consequences to be determined by the Security Council if Iraq violated the resolution. Even though Iraq did submit a weapons declaration and began destroying its Al Samud missiles as instructed to by UN inspector Hans Blix, serious consequences were imposed on the country anyway. It was the United States, however, and not the Security Council that determined those consequences for Iraq when President Bush went to war against Iraq on March 20, 2003. Experience in Iraq has proven that this administration will act unilaterally outside the mandate of the Security Council, thereby rendering the work of the Council almost irrelevant. At the same time, however, experience has indicated that this administration will use the UN to make its case for war to the world community. In the coming weeks and months, I think it's fairly predictable that we will see the United States' case for war against Iran unfold at the UN. I think it's highly probable the administration has already made the decision to go to war against Iran. There are already U.S. troops inside Iran. I want to repeat that. There are already U.S. troops inside Iran. On April 14th, retired Colonel Sam Gardner related on CNN that the Iranian ambassador to the IAEA, Alessagar Sultanaya, reported to him that the Iranians have captured dissident forces who have confessed to working with the U.S. troops in Iran. Earlier in the week, Seymour Hersh reported in The New Yorker that a U.S. source had told him that U.S. Marines were operating in the Baluchi, Azuri, and Kurdish regions of Iran. On April the 10th, The Guardian reported uh, that Vincent Canestraro, a former CIA counterterrorism chief, said that covert military action 
in the form of Special Forces troops identifying targets and aiding dissident groups is already underway and that it had been authorized. And, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I have uh, art these articles uh, that I have cited uh, for the record, if I may insert them without we'll objection. insert them in the record without objection. We also know from reports that the U.S. is supporting military activity in Iran by Iranian anti-government insurgent groups, some of which are operating from U.S.-occupied Iraq, such as the terrorist group Mujahideen al Qaq M.E.K. An article published by Newsweek magazine on February 14, 2005, confirms cooperation between U.S. government officials and the MEK. The article describes how, quote, the administration is seeking to call useful MEK members as operatives for use against Tehran, unquote. Furthermore, an article by Jim Loeb published on Antiwar.com on February 11, 2005, claims that according to Philip Giraldi, a former CIA official and source in an article about this subject in the American Conserv Conservative magazine, U.S. Special Forces have been directing members of the MEK in carrying out reconnaissance and intelligence collection in Iran since the summer of 2004. Even a statement attributed to Ambassador Bolton, and which I would like elaboration on today, seems to confirm the U.S. policy for Iran is war. According to an article published April 10, 2006, in The Guardian, Ambassador Bolton told British parliamentarians that he believes military action could halt or at least set back the Iranian nuclear program by striking at its weakest point. U.S. policy for Iran advocates regime change, not behavior change. We should expect that even if Iran decides to negotiate with the U.S. or other Security Council members over its nuclear program, U.S. policy promoting war in Iran will, will remain steadfast. When Iraq destroyed its missiles and submitted its, its weapons declaration, abiding by Security Council for, uh, Resolution 1441, the administration decided to unilaterally attack Iraq anyway. This administration is reckless in this, uh, in this regard. It is imperative that Congress exercise its oversight on the administration's plans for war with Iran before our country is immersed in another quagmire with more U.S. casualties, diminished national security, and a greater financial burden. I think, therefore, this committee, this oversight committee, is privileged to have Ambassador Bolton with us today. I have several questions for him regarding the administration's plans for Iran, and I look forward to his candid answers. I want to thank the Ambassador for being with us, thank Chairman Chase for holding this hearing. If we are going to uh, determine the effectiveness of sanctions, we also need to look at those sanctions in tandem with uh, the U.S. Uh, policy with respect to the use of our military. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the gentleman. Um, I think, Ambassador, you know that uh, you are here for the Oil for Food program in the U.N., but uh, it might go in other directions. And obviously, you, you would feel free to respond to any questions that you feel you have knowledge about or expertise. Um, uh, Mr. Waxman has told me he would like to add three minutes to his five-minute questioning by foregoing a statement. I will just acknowledge that the ranking member of the, of the full committee is here. Uh, and then at this time would rep well, rep well, may I just welcome uh, Ambassador Bolton. Good to Thank see you. Thank you. Again. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at this point, uh, the Chair would uh, recognize Mr. Lynch uh, from Massachusetts. Welcome, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you. I know this is the fourth uh, hearing we have had on this issue. I also want to thank uh, Ranking Member Waxman and Mr. Kucinich as well for staying on this issue. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your willingness to help this committee with its work. And at the outset, uh, I would like to uh, say that there have been grave uh, disclosures in terms of our failings at the U.N. with regard to uh, the Oil for Food program. And uh, it depends on whose figures you, you, you follow. Uh, GAO has estimated that uh, $10 billion in illicit uh, revenues, uh, kickbacks, and, and so forth uh, went to the Iraqi government under Saddam Hussein. Uh, as well, the Congressional Research Service determines that about $12.8 billion in illicit revenue went to the same regime. And uh, there's great misgivings about our ability to use sanctions as a, as a, as a proper tool uh, for statecraft in, in the future. We don't have a, a whole lot of options here. We don't have a whole lot of tools to use in terms of an alternative to, to military intervention. So this causes us great, uh, great concern that the U.N., in administering this program, in doing oversight of this program, 
allowed this to happen. And uh, perhaps it was from the very outset by giving Saddam Hussein so much power. We empowered his regime to choose those countries who we would, he would deal with. Uh, we allowed him to negotiate the prices of these contracts. We put him in a position where he was able to, to steal and skim from these contracts. And what we're looking for here is, uh, is an answer to, to the question of whether or not in the future uh, sanctions such as this, the Oil for Food program, are, are at all salvageable, are at all usable, and uh, whether enough reforms have been adopted by the UN uh, in, in, in light of what has happened here with the Iraqi Oil for Food program, whether those reforms will be effective to prevent the, the, uh, the collapse that we have seen and, and the tremendous cost uh, not only on the Iraqi people, but uh, on, on U.S. taxpayers and uh, uh, the U.N.'s credibility, uh, most of all. Uh, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. At this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Van Hollen. Welcome, Mr. Van Hollen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for uh, holding this hearing and uh, also thank uh, Mr. Kucinich uh, and Mr. Waxman uh, for their leadership. Uh, welcome, Ambassador Bolton. Uh, it's good to have you here, and I look forward to your uh, testimony. And I'm interested in some of the issues that have already been raised uh, by my colleagues uh, here, especially the extent to which you think sanctions can be effective uh, in the case of Iran and Sudan. I think experience tells us that uh, sometimes sanctions have been successful as a tool of foreign policy, and sometimes they haven't. It's been on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the circumstances, including both whether or not we're able to get the key trading partners of a particular country to cooperate uh, together, and the extent, of course, to which the country which we seek to impose sanctions on, the extent to which that country is vulnerable to sanctions and their economy. Uh, and I guess one of the questions that I, I hope you will uh, answer either in your testimony or your questions is, if we're not successful in the case of Iran uh, in getting the Security Council uh, to take some action uh, that would authorize collective action, uh, economic sanctions. What are the prospects of getting a group of countries together outside that framework uh, to impose sanctions, and how effective would it be in the absence of an official Security Council uh, action? And the same holds true uh, with Sudan. Uh, if we're unable to get sanctions uh, imposed on Sudan because of the reluctance of the Chinese or the Russians, and those two players are, of course, key in the Iran case as well. Uh, how successful uh, do you think economic sanctions uh, could be if you put together a so-called you know, coalition of the willing for sanctions uh, in the case of Sudan? So both in the case of Sudan and Iran, uh, I'm interested in, yeah, ho hopefully we'll get collective action at the Security Council level. But if, if that fails, uh, how effective do you think economic sanctions could be? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, at this time, um, seeing no other members, um, we will invite uh, the Honorable John R. Bolton, the, our ambassador, to give testimony. As you know, Ambassador, uh, uh, we swear in all our witnesses. There's only one person we never swore in, and that was Senator Byrd, and I chickened out. If you'd stand, just uh, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Um, Ambassador, um, uh, ordinarily we would have a five-minute rule, but uh, we want uh, all the members want you to make your statement uh, to the extent that you want to make it, and so uh, uh, we're, we don't have the clock on you. Is, is your mic on, sir? Hopefully it is now. Yeah. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd ask that the prepared statement be submitted for the record, and perhaps I could try and make a few remarks effectively in summary. Well, with that. that in mind, then, let me just take care of this business right now and ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record, and the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection. And ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record and without objection so ordered. Say whatever you'd like, sir. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin, if I could, by, by thanking you uh, and the subcommittee for holding this hearing. Um, I think that, uh, Mr. Chairman, your leadership in pursuing the uh, implications of the oil for food scandal uh, uh, through the, the work of the subcommittee has been uh, 
uh, critical in helping to uncover some of the uh, aspects of uh, how the program was administered and, and indeed affecting even the uh, investigation that uh, former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker undertook. And I think it's been a, uh, a real, uh, a very valuable uh, example of uh, effective congressional oversight. And uh, I welcome the fact you've held this many hearings and, and I hope that you and the subcommittee will continue your work because the uh, exposure of some of these problems, which uh, in many respects seem technical and complex and, and hard to understand, I think is important for the American people so that Congress's efforts to penetrate uh, some of these problems can be, can be quite, uh, quite important. Um, the issue of the uh, Iraq sanctions is something that, uh, that has been uh, a matter of concern to me for a long time. In fact, since I was Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations during the Bush 41 administration when the Security Council adopted Resolution 661 uh, and then uh, a few days later adopted Resolution 665 authorizing the use of force uh, to uh, ensure that Iraq uh, complied with the sanctions. And even after the uh, President Bush uh, left office, uh, I continued to uh, watch the development uh, of the sanctions program and the oil for food program as well. So I think that the uh, this is an important case study. You don't often get in international affairs uh, such a clear example of a program uh, that started off in one direction and that uh, veered badly in the wrong direction and eventually ended up uh, uh, not only not uh, providing the kind of consequences that were originally envisioned for it, but actually ended up perversely uh, supporting Saddam Hussein's regime and exposing uh, the UN to uh, well-justified criticism for mismanagement and corruption. Uh, and we start from the proposition that the President's efforts at reform at the UN are designed to uh, fundamentally change the way the organization operates, to make it possible for the United States and other governments to entrust the United Nations with uh, important responsibilities in international affairs. Uh, Louise Frechette, the a former Deputy Secretary General of the UN who just uh, recently left office uh, said uh, last year, and I quote now from her, uh, she said, personally, I hope to God we never get another oil for food program or anything approaching that kind of responsibility, close quote. Let me say, we don't agree with Deputy Secretary Frechette. Uh, it may well be necessary for the UN to administer a program, a complex program of sanctions and humanitarian assistance. Uh, we're looking now at the uh, extension of the UN mission in Sudan to the Darfur region it will result in a substantial enhancement uh, not only of the size of the peacekeeping operation, uh, but efforts to uh, undertake more effectively the humanitarian and relief operations and eventually the reconstruction and development operations that the Darfur region so desperately needs. We need an effectively functioning UN. We need a UN that can handle major sanctions programs. We need a UN that can carry out relief and development. That's why the President has laid the emphasis that he has on reforms, so that this question of sanctions and the question of the oil for food program are very much on the table right now. And it's important we understand the implications of the oil for food uh, program scandal and what, what that means for the future. And I really think that the uh, that the work that Chairman Paul Volcker did uh, is important uh, not only for uh, the uh, mismanagement and corruption that he uncovered in the oil for food program, but the, the lessons and the insights that Chairman Volcker derived from his work. And uh, I've had the occasion to speak with him several times on this subject. I think it's fair to say, and I think Chairman Volcker has said publicly, when he undertook the responsibility for looking into the oil for food program, uh, he did not anticipate the extent of the problems that he found. Uh, and when his commission's work concluded, uh, he has said publicly, testified in Congress uh, on a couple of occasions, that uh, he came to understand that the mismanagement and corruption that he found in the Oil for Food program didn't spring out of thin air. Uh, just as the Oil for Food program emerged from the United Nations Secretariat, uh, it used UN Secretariat employees. Uh, it followed Secretariat procedures and practices. The uh, deficiencies of the Oil for Food program really highlighted problems that were inherent that already existed in the UN structure itself. 
so that the solution to oil for food lay not only in how that program was run and not very carefully supervised by the UN, but in the basic culture of the UN itself. And uh, that to prevent future oil for food scandals required fundamental change in that UN culture. And one occasion when he testified uh, up here, a member of Congress asked Chairman Volcker if he thought there was a culture of corruption at the UN. And uh, Mr. Volcker responded, no, I don't think there's a culture of corruption, although there is corruption. I think there's a culture of inaction, a culture of inaction. And I think that's a very powerful descriptive uh, phrase for uh, the difficulties we see in the UN structure. And not just the United States, Mr. Chairman, but Secretary General Kofi Annan himself, who recently uh, uh, submitted a report to the UN General Assembly called Investing in the United Nations, where he suggested uh, a series of far-reaching management changes in procurement systems, in personnel systems, in auditing and accounting systems, and in information technology. The Secretary General himself said that what we needed at the UN was a radical restructuring of the Secretariat, uh, a, a refit of the uh, entire organization to fit the tasks that member governments were uh, imposing upon it. And I think it was very significant that the Secretary General himself, uh, who has spent much of his a career in the UN system was the one who used the phrase uh, radical overhaul or radical restructuring. Um, we have, uh, we, certainly we have not agreed with each and every one of his recommendations, but we absolutely agreed with the thrust of what he was trying to do. And in many cases on the management side, we would be prepared to go further. But I have to tell you, Mr. Chairman, on Friday, uh, the Secretary General's proposals for reform uh, suffered a significant setback in New York when the General Assembly's fifth committee, this is the committee that deals with budget matters, uh, adopted a resolution which, for all practical purposes, tanks the Secretary General's reform proposals. Uh, we opposed that. We worked with the other uh, uh, major contributors. We tried to find a compromise with the Group of 77, the G77, which actually has 132 members, the developing countries of the UN, uh, because we wanted to support the thrust of what the Secretary General had come up with. And many of these reforms that the Secretary General proposed were in direct response to Paul Volcker's uh, reports and the investigations of uh, this committee and others in Congress uh, to try to uh, minimize the possibility in the future of the kind of mismanagement and corruption that we saw in the Oil for Food program. Uh, so we were, we were disappointed at the outcome of the vote, which was uh, 108 in favor of this G77 resolution, 50 against, three abstaining, 30 countries not voting. It was a very significant split uh, between the countries that voted in favor of the G77 and those that voted against. The 108 countries that voted to uh, effectively sideline the Secretary General's report contribute about 12 percent of the UN budget. The 50 countries that voted against their resolution, the 50 countries that voted in favor of reform, contribute 86.7 percent of the UN budget. So I think the uh, disjunction between voting power in the General Assembly and contributions to the UN system has probably not been so graphically exposed in recent years. We're going to continue our efforts, Mr. Chairman, on management reform, and not just management reform, but program reform, reviewing the nearly 9,000 mandates that the UN Secretariat uh, currently operates under to find outdated, outmoded, ineffective, wasteful and duplicative mandates and programs and eliminate them. Uh, because the objective we have is to get to a point where we could turn to the UN uh, if we needed another oil for food program or needed another program of comparable size. We have a number of other uh, reforms that we're pushing as well, the deficiencies of which were also highlighted in the oil for food scandal. For example, we are uh, of the view that the existing UN Office of Internal Oversight Services, OIOS in UN jargon, uh, was, which was set up at the suggestion of the United States in the early 1990s when Dick Thornburg, the former governor of Pennsylvania, was Under Secretary General for Management. Uh, has not been given the kind of independence and autonomy that, that you and Congress understand when you talk about an Inspector General uh, office in the 
federal government's uh, major departments. We think OIOS has a lot of potential, but we don't think it has the independence or the budget that it needs to uh, look into the UN effectively. There was a recent GAO audit of OIOS that came essentially to the same conclusion, so that the strengthening of OIOS's independence and reach uh, is, is important. And had OIOS been as effective and as strong as we wanted in the early 1990s when Governor Thornburg recommended it, maybe they would have been able to look into the developing oil for food program and uncover some of the problems and, and, uh, and allow the UN to take uh, corrective action. Unfortunately, that did not happen. Uh, as a number of you have said in your introductory statements, the UN now faces important decisions on sanctions, possibly with respect to Iran and its uh, nuclear weapons program and its continuing state sponsorship of terrorism around the world. Uh, we recently in the Security Council imposed targeted sanctions on four individuals responsible for gross abuses of human rights in the Sudan, and we're looking at uh, other uh, uh, sanctions that might be imposed to try and bring the parties to uh, a resolution of the conflict in Darfur. That's not the only course we're pursuing. Uh, my colleague, uh, Deputy, Secre Deputy Secretary Bob Zellick, uh, uh, flew last night to Abuja to lend a hand to try and rescue the African Union mediation of the peace process there. Uh, but certainly, we are committed to uh, taking action through the United Nations to try and restore stability in Darfur and bring security to the people there to allow the refugees and the internally displaced persons to return to their homes in safety. So these kinds of issues uh, are going to be with us and I think, in fact, uh, Mr. Chairman, in growing importance over the, the next months and years. And I think getting uh, uh, the UN to the point where it can administer these kinds of sanctions programs effectively uh, without mismanagement and corruption. Uh, is critically important, uh, not only for uh, the reasons that we want American taxpayers' dollars to be spent effectively, but for the benefit of the people uh, for which these sanctions and, and programs are, are carried out so that we don't have the anomalous result that uh, came from the Oil for Food program in Iraq. So, Mr. Chairman, let me just close, and I, I appreciate your giving me some uh, latitude in terms of timing. I'd be delighted to try and answer the committee's questions and look forward to them. Thank you, Ambassador. I think the entire committee appreciates uh, your statement and was happy that you uh, uh, had the time to uh, make the points you needed to. Uh, at this time, the Chair would recognize uh, Mr. Kucinich um, uh, as the ranking member of this committee. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to defer to the, uh, <clears throat> to the head of our uh, Democratic side, the ranking member on the full committee, Mr. Waxman. And, and as I stated earlier, um, Mr. Waxman, we're giving you, uh, we're putting down eight minutes, uh, not five. Uh, and uh, obviously, um, hopefully we'll have a chance to do a, a little bit of a second round as well, but we'll Great. see. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Kucinich, uh, Ambassador Bolton, pleased that you are here. Uh, the um, hearing today is about the Oil for Food program. And one of the fundamental purposes of the program was to provide food and other necessities without giving Iraq the ability to develop weapons of mass destruction. The position of the Bush administration prior to the wars was that the oil for food program, international sanctions, and UN inspections had failed. Uh, we now know that President Bush made a horrible misjudgment. He led our nation into war on false premises. And I want to ask how President Bush and his administration could have been so fundamentally wrong. Mr. Bolton, prior to becoming U.S. Representative to the U.N., you were the Under Secretary for Arms Control and International Security at the State Department. You were the Senior Advisor to the President and to the Secretary on all arms control issues. Your job was to, quote, manage global U.S. security policy, principally in the areas of nonproliferation, arms control, regional security and defense relations, and arms transfers and security assistance. I'd like to ask you about one of the major reasons the administration concluded that the Oil for Food program and related UN efforts were not working, namely the administration's claim that despite these international pressures, Iraq was nonetheless seeking uranium from Niger. As you know, an NIE, a National Intelligence Estimate on Iraq's WMD, was issued in October of 2002. The NIE stated that Iraq was, quote, vigorously trying to procure uranium, end quote, from Africa. Uh, 
This language is amazing given how wrong, given how wrong it was and how many U.S. intelligence officials voiced opposition at the time. Can you tell us who actually wrote that language? Who was the specific individual who drafted the sentence? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I'm not a member or was not a member of the intelligence community. NIEs are drafted by the intelligence community. I had no role whatever in the preparation of that document. Okay. Let's uh, take a look, closer look at the facts. The CIA clearly didn't accept the Niger claim. Appearing on 60 Minutes last week, Tyler Drumheller, the head of CIA operations in Europe, reported that he didn't believe the claim. He also said the CIA sh station chief in Rome didn't support the allegation. Robert Walpole, the CIA's top weapons official, also expressed strong doubts about the claim. And of course, we know George Tennant was personally involved in efforts to get the White House to stop repeating the claims, pulling it from the President's October 7th speech in Cincinnati. We also know that the Defense Department officials opposed it. General Carlton Fulford, the Deputy Commander of U.S. European Command, traveled to Niger personally and debunked the claim. He reported his findings directly to Richard Myers, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And your agency, the State Department, also opposed the claim. Secretary Powell refused to make the claim in his speech to the U.N. General Assembly. Uh, given the doubts raised by all these officials from all these different agencies, can you identify a single person anywhere in the U.S. government who supported the uranium claim, and if so, who? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any. I think the, uh, the people read the NIE, and, uh, and that was the information that was available. You were the top arms control official in the administration. Are you saying you don't know of a single person who supported one of the primary claims that led our nation to war? I, I'm saying, uh, Congressman, that there are people responsible for the aggregation and presentation of intelligence information uh, that was done through the vehicle of the NIE that you quoted and other uh, uh, products of the uh, intelligence community, and that was the information that was available to decision makers. Uh, the, so the claim uh, came. I could I just finish, yes. please? Uh, I don't uh, have a separate. Uh, didn't in my previous job have a separate intelligence uh, capability. So the information that was provided was the information that was available. Well, the NIE was supposed to gather information from all the relevant agencies. Let me turn to the United Nations. On, on December 7th, 2002, Iraq submitted a declaration claiming it had no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we now know that was true. In, on December 19th, however, your agency, the State Department, issued a so-called fact sheet to the United Nations stating that the Iraqi declaration, quote, ignores efforts to procure uranium from Niger, end quote. This was the first time the U.S. government made the Niger claim publicly. The press immediately jumped on it, and NBC Nightly News reported, quote, what could Iraq be hiding? U.S. officials say Iraq attempted to buy uranium from Africa to procure nuclear weapons, end quote. But by this time, the State Department had received the actual documents underlying the Niger claim, and your intelligence bureau was saying they were bogus. My question is why the United States was making false claims to the United Nations. Who put this claim into the State Department fact sheet? I, I have no idea. I didn't participate in the drafting of the fact sheet. I first saw it uh, for the first time, I believe, last year during my confirmation hearing. Well, it, the fact sheet was created from a draft of a speech to the Security Council by Ambassador Negroponte. I understand that Ambassador Negroponte, your predecessor, spoke to the Security Council on around December 19, and the fact sheet was developed from a draft of his speech. But what I don't understand is why this claim was in Ambassador Negroponte's speech to begin with. What role did you play in preparing Ambassador Negroponte's speech to the Security Council? None. If you were the top arms control official in the U.S. government, Iraq's nuclear program was the number one arms control issue in the administration. Are you saying you played no role in this speech, you didn't help draft it, you never reviewed it? That's correct. Okay. Did you put the claim into the speech prepared for Ambassador Negroponte? I certainly did not. I just said twice I had no role in the, pres the, the preparation of the speech. Okay. Um, did you have access to the transcript or recording of Ambassador Negroponte's speech? Uh, did I have access to it? Probably. Did I read it? I don't think so. Um, could you provide to the committee as well as the drafts uh, of the speech that form the basis of the fact sheet? Do you have that available to I you? Don't, I don't have that available. 
Um, I'd like to ask you one uh, final set of questions. On April 9 of this year, the Washington Post issued a story entitled, quote, a concerted effort to discredit Bush critic, end quote. This article makes an astonishing claim. It says that in January 2003, the National Intelligence Council, which coordinates the U.S. intelligence agencies, issued a memo that forcefully debunked the uranium claim in unequivocal terms. Contrary to the NIE, this memo warned that the Niger story was baseless and should be laid to rest, according to the Post. Were you aware of the January 2003 memo from the National Intelligence Council? Did you receive it, and can you provide a copy to this committee? Uh, I don't know whether I received it at the time or not. I don't have any recollection of it. I certainly don't have a copy of it today. The article says that the memo was distributed widely, including to the White House, yet it was during this exact same time frame that the White House escalated its use of this false allegation. For example, on January 20th, President Bush sent a letter to Congress that included the uranium claim. On January 23, Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz made the claim in a speech before the Council on Foreign Relations. Condoleezza Rice wrote an op-ed making the uranium claim on January 23. On January 29, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld made the claim during a nationally televised press conference. And of course, the President made the claim in his State of the Union address on January 28th, the now infamous 16 words. Again, you were the top arms control official. How could it be that the President, the Defense Secretary, the National Security Advisor, all of these top administration officials are making this claim when the National Intelligence Council specifically warned it was bogus? That would have to be the, uh, your answer would be the last response. Yeah, I mean, I think you'd have to ask them. Do you expect, accept no. any responsibility for having uh, failed these officials for allowing them to repeat this uh, Henry, uh, falsehood? This is my last question. I, I don't think anybody ever asked me whether I thought they ought to say it or not. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Congressman. I had no, no, uh, no role in this, uh, in this issue. You didn't speak out okay. against me. You know, if, with all due respect, the gentleman's time is, has, has Well, ended. could I just get an answer to that? No, you didn't I, speak I, out for it? Did you speak out against it? The gentleman's I, time is over. Thank I, you. I, I, I would like to answer. I honestly sure. don't recall this uh, being an issue that I spent any time on. Thank you. Sorry. It's um, amazing. Sorry. Mr. Bolton, um, obviously uh, we're going to have questions about a lot of issues. So one of the things I find rather refreshing is uh, usually when members don't want to answer questions uh, before us, they, they end up spending uh, five minutes responding to each question so someone doesn't get a chance to ask their questions. And you gave uh, uh, the ranking member a chance to go through a lot, and that's appreciated. Thank you. I, um, I want to ask you. Uh, what is the reason the uh, group of uh, uh, G77 uh, opposed the reform agenda, in your judgment? Why did they oppose it? I think, I think there's a complex of reasons there. I think, first, they're uh, concerned about uh, the lo potential loss of programs and jobs in the UN system that might occur if we really did have a radical restructuring of the Secretariat. Uh, I think they're uh, concerned as well because the exact uh, dimensions of our reform efforts are not entirely clear. Uh, and I think they're concerned as a matter of uh, allocation of political responsibility that if the major contributors to the UN stick together, uh, that they might be able to reshape the programs in a way that their mere numerical voting power on the floor of the General Assembly would not otherwise be able to do. Uh, I want to tell you, though, uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we believe that the reforms that uh, we are proposing in the UN are for the benefit of all of the member governments. We think that if the UN were more effective, more efficient, more transparent, more responsive, uh, that uh, the United States and I think others would be more willing to entrust it to important responsibilities in the solution of international problems. It's when we see a vehicle that is not effective uh, not responsive, not transparent, uh, that we're reluctant to entrust it with, uh, with important tasks. So we, it, it, is our, uh, it is our intention, and we've, we're making substantial efforts to try and convince the G77 that they should embrace these reforms, that they're not just something that the United States or the other major contributors want. And as I noted uh, in my opening uh, remarks, that many of these reforms are reforms that the Secretary General himself has proposed, so they're hardly an American conspiracy. Can you um, tell me, though, how, how are you going to be able to convince the bulk of these nations to uh, 
uh, allow these reforms to go forward. I mean, I'm just thinking diplomacy is great, but ultimately, how are you going to get it done? Well, I think that uh, I am hoping that the vote on uh, Friday will be uh, perceived by a good chunk of the G77 uh, to be a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, that is to say, although the arithmetic was in favor of their resolution because of numbers on the, on the, on the floor of the Fifth Committee, that they will see that uh, repudiating the countries that contribute the overwhelming bulk of the UN budget uh, isn't a way to win friends and influence people. And this is something that I know Congress has been concerned about over the years, but, you know, it's not just the American Congress. The Japanese diet uh, has expressed great concern about the fact that uh, Japan is the second largest contributor to UN assessed budgets. 19.5 percent is the Japanese share, second only to our 22 percent. Uh, and yet it now looks increasingly likely like that Japan will not succeed in its uh, efforts to acquire a permanent seat on the UN Security mm -hmm. Council. And there are strong indications that many uh, members of the Japanese diet are going to look to a downward adjustment of Japan's share. And other large contributors, uh, I think, uh, share many of these concerns. So this is something that, uh, uh, that, that it will require a substantial amount of advocacy on our part, but we think it's important to do, and, and we're trying to engage in that advocacy. When you, when you talk about depoliticizing the Security Council, what, what are you making reference to? Well, I think the, uh, w the, the question of reform of the Security Council has taken up a, a great deal of oxygen in the UN system over the past year or so, and the uh, prospects for a change in the permanent membership uh, at this point do not look uh, very substantial, although it's certainly the position of the United States that the uh, permanent membership as it now stands reflects the world of 1945 instead of the world of 2006. We believe Japan, for example, should be a permanent member of the Security Council, and we're prepared to continue to work for that. But the uh, opposition of uh, China, the opposition of other countries has made it uh, impossible so far to achieve that objective. Let me um, uh, make a point and then have you respond to it. In the Dolphin report, he said no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, but he also said that Saddam had bought off uh, France and Russia in the oil for food program, which is what we're talking about and that he was absolutely convinced that we would not have uh, their support in uh, providing uh, any action against Iraq. I'm struck with the fact that, that we never would have uh, because the French and the Russians were bought off. We hear France, as it relates to dealing with the nuclear issue in Iran, say to us, uh, they're not going to support sanctions if uh, it doesn't pass a UN muster, which means We've got to get the Russians and the Chinese to agree. Um, knowing their issue about uh, uh, energy, I wonder how it's ever possible. And then I begin to think, well, you'll never see the UN ever take meaningful action on any issue. So, uh, and let me just say, it's my understanding, and I said it in my statement, if sanctions, if you don't want war, if you don't want military actions, you've got to have sanctions that work. So if you could just respond to this final, yeah. this final question I've asked. Well, I, I think your uh, point about the role of sanctions is critical. If you look at the, at the other two uh, ends of the spectrum, one is the uh, application of diplomatic and political uh, measures on one hand, use of force on the other, sanctions which were really uh, developed in American political theory as a <laughs> diplomatic tool by Woodrow Wilson provide something in the middle, something that uh, may give you the opportunity to exert leverage and pressure to achieve a desired outcome short of the use of force. And I think that, uh, as uh, Congressman Van Hollen said, whether sanctions succeed or not depends on the particular facts and circumstances of a given situation. Uh, I would offer the example of Libya, where targeted sanctions uh, were imposed uh, in the wake of the bombing of Pan Am 103 and uh, which over time I think were an important contributing factor, uh, among others to be sure, but were an important contributing factor to the Libyan decision to give up the pursuit of nuclear weapons. Uh, so that the, the uh, utility of sanctions, both for the effect they can have on the desired target, but also for the uh, political support that can be gained to show, for example, that use of force is not the first option, not the preferred option, that you're willing to undertake uh, other measures short of the use of force uh, helps uh, build and keep coalitions together. Uh, 
specifically with respect to Iran, uh, it is true that there have been statements by Russia and China that they will not accept uh, sanctions. My own view is that um, as we get into the concrete drafting of particular uh, Security Council resolutions, that uh, we'll see how those positions play out in fact. And uh, uh, we'll be turning this week, uh, in fact, to a uh, resolution uh, which we will propose under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter which will make mandatory on Iran uh, all of the existing IAEA resolutions calling out on it to uh, suspend its uranium enrichment program and, and so on. Uh, a permanent member of the Security Council obviously has the option to veto such a resolution, but a permanent member also has the option to abstain. And abstaining, when a permanent member abstains, that is acquiescing in the Security Council taking action assuming there's otherwise a majority of nine votes. We just saw a case of that in the Sudan sanctions that I mentioned. Uh, last week, we adopted a resolution sanctioning four individuals by a vote of 12 to 0 to 3, Russia, China, and Qatar abstaining, 12 votes in favor, no votes against. Uh, so Russia and China, in that case, uh, chose not to veto the imposition of sanctions by abstaining, allowed the sanctions to go into effect. And while it would be desirable to have a unanimous Security Council when we adopt this resolution uh, under Chapter 7, making uh, Iran, uh, uh, directing Iran to comply mandatorily with the IAEA reg uh, resolutions, uh, it's, uh, it's not impossible that we would proceed without them. And if they abstain, then that resolution will go into effect, as would subsequent sanctions resolutions if we get to that point. Thank you. Um, before recognizing Mr. Kucinich, I I, I, I don't usually do this, but uh, two people you know that actually work in this hearing are our recorders. And uh, I just want to welcome Elizabeth back. She's just had two twins. And you make sure that, uh, excuse me, uh, Diane has had two twins. And Elizabeth has four children. And I just learned that Jeffrey, her five-year-old, uh, who plays the trumpet, is going to be on the Today program on uh, May 11th. Um, we both thank you both for your work. and. Uh, uh, your mother's, uh, besides doing all this, and extraordinary children besides. And you have to record all that while I'm saying it, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I applaud you both. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kucinich, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you for uh, I injecting a, uh, a, n a note of humanity into these hearings, because it's always good to uh, get the personal connections here. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, thanks again for being here. Uh, you spoke of Woodrow Wilson and his uh, view of sanctions as being kind of a midpoint. And we're here talking about the effectiveness of sanctions. Um, I'm wondering about the effectiveness of sanctions uh, if a series of steps have already been taken that leapfrog past uh, what sanctions could hope to achieve. Question. If the United States uh, is, is engaging in covert anti-government activity in Iran, is this legal under UN law? Well, U U UN doesn't impose law, and in any event, uh, uh, it's not appropriate to comment in a public section, session on anything related to intelligence activities. And, uh, and so with respect, I, I will simply decline to discuss that. It's not, it's not anything I would have anything to do anyway. My job is in New York. Uh, if the U.S. has combat troops in Iran, would that be a violation of the U.N. Charter? Uh, uh, Congressman, I have no knowledge of, uh, of, of, of that subject at all, and I just don't think it's uh, helpful to, to speculate on, uh, on that matter. I, if if, if uh, there are others in the administration who'd like to talk to on it, I'm, sh I'm sure you could summon them, but it's not anything I'm uh, involved in in any way. And what would be a uh, legal justification for one sovereign country to insert its military forces into another sovereign country under UN law? Article 51 of the UN Charter provides for the inherent right of individual and collective self-defense. That's a pretty good basis. I'll ask that again. For one sovereign country to insert 
its military forces into another sovereign country. This is not self-defense. Well, I think self-defense, as, uh, uh, as the Secretary General's uh, high-level panel a few years ago uh, recognized, comes in a multitude of forms. And you asked a hypothetical question, and I gave you an answer. Well, hypothetically, is preemption self-defense? Uh, it certainly can be, absolutely, as the, as the Secretary General's own high-level panel uh, recognized. Then uh, is Iran an imminent threat to the United States? Uh, Congressman, you know, the President has made it clear that his purpose and his priority is to achieve a peaceful and diplomatic uh, resolution to the threat to international peace and security posed by the Iranian nuclear weapons program. He said repeatedly, as has Secretary Rice, that, of course, we never take any option off the table. But uh, the uh, priority that we're addressing now, and certainly my responsibility, is diplomacy and the Security Council. Do you know of a presidential national security directive on regime change in Iran? I do not. When did you become aware that regime change was uh, in Iran was a uh, U.S. policy? Well, I don't, I don't think that's an accurate statement of the policy. I think Secretary Rice testified before Congress some, I guess it's some months ago now, that we were requesting a $75 million increase in support to an aggregate level of $85 million for uh, activities supporting uh, democracy in Iran. And I think that is the uh, ultimate objective we speak, a, a free and democratically elected regime in Iran that we could hopefully persuade to give up the pursuit of nuclear weapons. Uh, we've seen a report in The New Yorker by Seymour Hersh that uh, a U.S. source told them that U.S. Marines were operating in the Baluchi, Azuri, and Kurdish regions of Iran. Have you ever heard of that report? I've never heard of the report. I've never read the article, nor do I intend to. Do you have any interest as to whether or not, as the U.S. ambassador, I don't. you don't have any interest as I, to whether or not U.S. Marines are actually operating in Iran right now? I, I said I had not heard of the report, and I didn't intend to read the article in The New Yorker. If I gave you this article right now and walked it over, would you look at it? I, I don't think so, honestly, Congressman, because I, I, don't, I don't have time to read much fiction. Well, you know, now, if it wasn't fiction, Mr. Bolton, would that be of interest to you? Uh, Congressman, it is of interest to me to be as fully informed on matters affecting my responsibilities in the government as I can. Uh, I have no responsibility uh, for the matters you're talking about, and I think that uh, there's a lot of unfounded speculation. The President has been as clear as he can be that his priority is a peaceful, and diplomatic uh, resolution uh, of the Iranian nuclear weapons program, and that's the direction I'm trying to carry out in New York. That's my well, job. Well, wait a minute, Mr. Ambassador. Mr. It, how Mr. do we know, if we know U.S. troops are in Iran, how does this affect U.N. negotiations? Well, Congressman, you know more than I do. That's all I can yeah. say. Here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman? You had the floor. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, if I could follow up firstly on, on uh, Mr. Waxman's questions. Uh, as he has stated, prior to becoming the U.S. representative to the U.N., you were the Undersecretary for Arms Control uh, and International Security at the State Department. You were the senior advisor to the President and to the Secretary on all arms control issues. Your job was to manage global U.S. security principally in the areas of nonproliferation, arms control, regional security, and defense relations, and arms transfer and security assistance. Now, I accept your previous answers that you had no involvement with the Niger uranium, uranium purchase theory, but, but given, given your job description, given the sphere of your responsibility, I find it stunning that, that you were, I believe you, were, just as you say, out of the loop with all those responsibilities that you have in advising the President. That he came to the American people and, and basically presented this theory that, what, which we now know is false, that that uh, Saddam was trying to buy uranium 
from Niger. And I, I just, again, I, I just find it stunning that you were not in the loop. I believe you. I believe that you, you have no culpability in that theory. But I, but I also think that the opposite side of the coin is, is equally damning that, that you were excluded from, from all of that, given your responsibilities. Uh, do, do, do you tend to agree with that? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, no, I don't think I was excluded from anything. I think that the uh, questions that uh, Congressman Waxman uh, was asking dealt with uh, issues of intelligence uh, collection and analysis. And in that sense, uh, I was a consumer, uh, not a producer. I'm not, I was not, my job was not part of the intelligence community. It was not part of my responsibility. Well, I, I, I beg to differ, sir, with all due respect. And, and I think this goes to Mr. Kucinich's questions as well that uh, with respect to the, the, um, the theory again or, or, or the supposition that we may have uh, U.S. troops operating in Iran. I, I, now, I, I, I don't think you should take anything uh, at face value in any periodical. However, I, I do suggest very strongly that you have, an, you have an obligation to inform yourself. And I just came back from Iraq last Sunday. and. Uh, let me just leave it at that, that I do believe you have an obligation to inform yourself. I agree. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that you should, uh, on an issue of, of such grave importance and, and given your position, that you should uh, deny the opportunity to at least weigh, weigh that evidence and weigh that information, sir. Um, basically, one of the main criticisms of, of uh, the sanctions issue, if we can get back to that, uh, is that there are no, no guidelines, no, no, no firm standards by which we implement. There, there, there is some information and some guidelines on, on the authorization of sanctions, but at the implement, implementation stage, there's been great criticism about how we carry those out and the relationships between uh, the Secretariat and, and also uh, with governments and the legal relations uh, between those. Uh, have you uh, have you made recommendations, or do you have solid recommendations that would coincide with what with, with, uh, uh, Secretary General Anand is is recommending to the UN that uh, that might solve that that problem? Well, I think one of the one of the difficulties with the uh, sanctions regime on Iraq in the in the aftermath of the uh, the ceasefire. Uh, in 1991 was that uh, attention, international attention, drifted away from the enforcement of the sanctions regime. And uh, that was a, as occurred during the 1990s, that was a, a problem uh, uh, that the United States uh, uh, was partially responsible for, that it, uh, it sure. simply did not receive as uh, high priority as it had in, uh, in an earlier period. And I think that is a uh, central element of the question of the uh, utility of sanctions once applied. In other words, that uh, uh, the uh, imposition of sanctions in the first instance ought to have an objective and a purpose, and there ought to be uh, ways of uh, trying to evaluate whether the sanctions are, uh, remain effective or, or whether they have uh, ceased their usefulness. And I can give you an example of that in the U.S. context. Um, uh, not UN sanctions, but US sanctions after India and Pakistan tested nuclear weapons in 1998, uh, the United States imposed a variety of trade sanctions on both countries. Uh, and I can tell you that by the uh, early uh, part of uh, the summer of 2001, uh, the, the, what was then the relatively new Bush administration had come to the conclusion that the sanctions that uh, had been in place against India and Pakistan were not having any effect, that the uh, governments of India and Pakistan manifestly were not going to give up the nuclear weapons they had acquired, and that uh, the sanctions that we had put in place were impeding our ability to discuss with both India and Pakistan not only the issue of their nuclear capability, but uh, a range of other issues as well. So that uh, actually even before September the 11th, but then Shortly thereafter that, the decision was made to, uh, to lift the sanctions because they weren't effective. That's at least an example, but I, I don't think you can write hard and fast rules. I do think that the sanctions, as uh, in the case of most 
policy tools depend on the uh, environment in which they're imposed and, and so on. But I do think that uh, uh, having a better, uh, a, a greater clarity and objectives when sanctions are imposed and uh, greater rigor in analyzing their effectiveness during their lifetime would be, uh, would be a sensible thing to do. Just okay. a quick follow-up. Just, just one very quick follow-up. Based on what the Secret General, Secretary General is recommending in his, re his reform package that was, was defeated uh, last Friday, how closely, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, how closely does, the, does his reforms, I know you have said you would go further, but how closely does he come to, to where, would you where you would like to see him in terms of uh, that, those reforms? Yeah, in terms of what he recommended in his report, investing in the United Nations, I, I can say this roughly, I think between 80 and 90 percent of those suggestions are okay. things that we would agree with. As, as you indicated, we'd probably go further in some cases, but in terms of the uh, utility of what he had suggested, we're with him on a very high percentage. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for your uh, testimony. I believe that the fact that the United States thumbed its nose at the United Nations in the lead-up to the war in Iraq and the decision to go to war in Iraq without going back and getting uh, greater authorization consensus through the UN process has made it more difficult uh, to persuade others at the United Nations now uh, to take collective actions with respect to Iran. I also think the fact that we lost a tremendous amount of credibility with respect to claims about weapons of mass destruction when it turned out not to be weapons of mass destruction has made it more difficult with respect to Iran. I would just take us back to uh, one of your predecessors, uh, Ambassador Adlai Stevenson, at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, who unveiled with great drama uh, the fact that the Soviets were putting missiles into Cuba, uh, and it turned out to be true. And I would contrast that with Secretary Powell's performance in the United Nations uh, with your predecessor, Ambassador Negroponte, where he displayed evidence against Iraq, which he has conceded turned out to be false uh, and which I think has undermined our credibility in a significant way. And Secretary Powell has acknowledged that this was one of the low points uh, of his career. The President's acknowledged himself uh, that the failure to find weapons of mass destruction, despite our earlier comments and evidence, has made it more difficult uh, in this area to persuade others because of a greater skepticism, which he said is understandable. If you could talk a little bit about how that has affected your efforts at the United Nations. I mean, the President's acknowledged uh, the issue. What steps have you had to take to reassure uh, your colleagues, and how much has this been a problem? Well, first, I, I don't think it's accurate to say that the United States thumbed its nose at the uh, Security Council before launching the operation that overthrew Saddam Hussein. In the first place, uh, there was no need to go to the UN uh, even to obtain Resolution 1441. It's perfectly clear that Iraq's persistent violations of the ceasefire resolution, Resolution 678, uh, renewed the authority of Resolution. 687, rather, renewed the authority of Resolution 678 to use force. So that uh, in terms of, because when a participant in a ceasefire resolution acknowledging it as Iraq did repeatedly violates it, it vitiates the force of the ceasefire. So there was no, re there was no need under uh, Security Council precedent or authority to go back even for 1441. But second, uh, uh, and as you quoted the phrase, serious consequences if Iraq didn't comply with 1441, there wasn't a country in that room that didn't know what serious consequences meant. So in terms of uh, whatever obligations we had under uh, Security Council previously existing resolutions or, uh, or current practice, uh, there's no doubt that, uh, that we did what was necessary and the uh, the, the, uh, the only tragedy there is that the Security Council itself didn't follow through to enforce its own resolutions because if the Security Council doesn't care about the integrity of its resolutions, you can be sure nobody else will. Second, on the issue of weapons of mass destruction, you know, I think one of the, in Iraq, I think one of the most important aspects uh, of the conclusion that uh, Saddam Hussein had, still had weapons of mass destruction came not from intelligence, 
but from Iraq itself. In 1991, under the terms of Resolution 687, Iraq was required to make Mr. full. I, Mr. Mess, I'm, my problem is I've got limited time. Yeah, and, but I'm, and, and I want to give no, you a complete no, li answer. Listen, listen. The let, let, me, let me just say this, too. I'll, I'll let you have more time. That's fine. Thank okay, you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. The, uh, the Iraqis were, were uh, required to make a declaration of WMD assets that they had. And one of the declarations that Saddam made in 1991 was a declaration of a considerable amount of chemical agent, chemical weapons agent. The terms of 687 required that under the supervision of UNSCOM, the first UN Weapons uh, Inspection Commission, Iraq was required, Iraq was required to prove the destruction of the weapons it had declared. And during the entire period from 1991 forward to 2002, Iraq never proved it had destroyed the chemical weapons agent that it had declared. Hans Blix, the chairman of, uh, of uh, UNMAVIC, the second UN weapons investigation, went to the Iraqis, and as he has recounted the story himself, he said, where is the proof you have destroyed the chemical agent that you declared? And the Iraqis said, well, we, we destroyed it. We just didn't keep any records of it. Hans Blix said to the Iraqis in his own recounting of the story, that stuff isn't marmalade. If you destroyed it, you have records of it. And the Iraqis never produced records. Uh, this was deemed sufficiently credible by our military and by other coalition military leaderships that when they went into Iraq, the forces took with them chemical weapons protective gear. That uh, was a decision that that gear is hot, it's heavy, it's cumbersome. No responsible military uh, leader would have burdened their combat troops with that equipment unless they had thought that the potential use of chemical Mr. agents Mr. Chairman, I'm just going to say with all due respect, I mean, I had a specific yeah, question with respect okay. you, to... You haven't, you haven't forgotten your question yet. The gentleman has two minutes. I'm, uh, well, yeah, okay. Yeah, let, yeah, me, yeah, let me... Go let me, for it. Let me, let me go for quickly respond. <laughs> no, you got he didn't, time. Well, he, no, he didn't. I asked... The President himself has acknowledged in statements that our failure to find WND in Iraq has... Uh, created more difficulties with respect to persuading other countries with respect to Iran. Uh, he has said it. Mr. Bolton just gave us a, a long talk. The fact of the matter is, El Barati and Hans Blix, before we went to war in Iraq, both of them urged the United States to take greater time to allow the UN weapons inspectors to make a determination about whether or not weapons of mass destruction existed. We decided to ignore that request for additional time, and the result in the end was, we know, there were no weapons of mass destruction. Now, I'm, I'm very pleased you mentioned the fact with the, the earlier resolutions, 678 and 687, because before we went into Iraq, on the eve of the invasion, the President did cite those two resolutions, and he said, the United States and our allies are authorized to use force in ridding Iraq of weapons of mass destruction. This is not a question of authority, it is a question of will, which is the argument you were just making. Now, I would, we, are, we are currently trying to get the United Nations to act under Chapter 7, the Security Council with respect to Iran. Chapter 7 uh, is the provision under the UN Charter, action with respect to threats to the peace, breaches of the peace, and acts of aggression. I would submit to you, Mr. Ambassador, that one of the reasons it's very difficult for us now to get the support of those countries in the Security Council is their fear that we will later use that Security Council resolution as a justification to use military force, perhaps unilaterally. And you just referenced two instances where the President did that. Let me ask you, if the United Nations Security Council were to invoke Chapter 7 with respect to sanctions against Iran, can you give them an assurance that the United States will not later rely on that resolution to take unilateral military action against Iran? The purpose of invoking Chapter I would appreciate Chapter it if you 7, answer the question. It's directly yeah. related to your duties as yeah. our ambassador. Well, that's, to the that's why I'd like to get it straight what Chapter 7 does. And I would refer you to Article 39 of the UN Charter, which states that it's the Security Council's responsibility to ascertain uh, whether there is a threat or a breach of international peace and security and to make recommendations to deal with that threat. The Iranian nuclear weapons program is unquestionably a threat to international peace and security, as we have been urging for over three years now to have the International Atomic Energy Agency refer the Iranian program to the Security Council. Uh, that is something that the uh, Security Council in its March presidential statement unanimously agreed that it was time to call on Iran to comply with those 
IAEA uh, resolutions. And it is the subject of the Chapter 7 resolution that we uh, are urging now on the Security Council. The reason to urge a Chapter 7 resolution is that under the UN Charter, a Chapter 7 resolution is mandatory on all UN members, mandatory, even on Iran, whether it likes it or not, as long as it's a UN member. The purpose of Chapter 7, therefore, is not to lay the basis necessarily for any further action, peaceful action, sanctions action, or the use of force. It's to make it mandatory uh, on the government of Iran. And that's the purpose of it right now. We're going to do this one resolution at a time. I understand, but Mr. Time. Chairman, if I could just get an answer sure. to the question, which was, we, look, we, we, I referenced the earlier resolutions, UN resolutions that the President relied on to take military action in Iraq. I would suggest that one of the reasons it's going to be difficult to get the consensus that we want to take at the Security Council for economic sanctions is a fear that the United States will later point to that as justification for unilateral military action. I'm wondering if you're able to tell uh, ch the Chinese and, and the Russians and the others that we will not point to that action, the Security Council with respect to sanctions, as justification later on for U unilateral yeah, U.S. military your, action. Your question contains a non sequitur, which is why it's not possible to act. But I would say what's significant in the Council today is that the United States, France and Britain are together on this. Russia and China are not yet, but I don't think any of us would advocate, I hope not, that Russia and China would dictate the steps we ought to take to protect our own national security. I'm certainly not suggesting that, Mr. Ambassador. I'm asking you if that is one of the elements that is making it more difficult to get consensus because of the earlier way we dealt with the Security Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, you've been here about an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, how much more time do you have? Do you have 10 more minutes? I, I, I'm having fun, Mr. Chairman. I can spend a few more, few yeah. more minutes. Why don't we do this? Uh, let me, Mr. Kucinich, uh, why don't I give you three minutes? And, and that, what's that? Do you want, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm just following the order and if he wants to yield. I, I'm I, trying to be respectful of the process. I, I'd certainly yield to Mr. Waxman in a heartbeat. Yeah. So. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kucinich and Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Bolton, it was interesting your response to uh, Congressman Van Hollen's question because you went through a lot of legalisms of why we were justified in taking the action we did to enforce the UN resolutions when the UN didn't care enough to enforce it themselves. But we do have a credibility problem, and that is that we went to war not for the UN to enforce UN resolutions, but to stop Iraq from developing weapons of mass destruction. I must tell you, I voted for that resolution because I defer to the administration when they said that Iraq could be a, mil a, a nuclear threat. Now, y you were, I want to clarify your answers to my question because you said despite the fact you were the top arms control official in the administration, you were not involved in the preparation of the December 19, 2002 State Department fact sheet in which the administration first made public the uranium claim. You also testified you had no involvement whatsoever in the development of the December 19 speech by Negroponte on which the fact sheet was based. I understand from the Department of, uh, State Department Inspector General, however, that your office was deeply involved in both the preparation of the fact sheet and the Negroponte speech. Was it true that your office, specifically the Non-Proliferation Bureau, was involved in the preparation of the Negroponte speech? Uh, they may well have been. I should explain to you, Congressman, that when I was undersecretary, I had four separate bureaus reporting to me. They did uh, a lot of staff work on a lot of issues that never came to my attention, and appropriately so. I couldn't do all the work of the 600 people who reported to me. So you had no involvement in the draft of a speech to the United Nations claiming that the reason we needed to be concerned about Iraq was because they were trying to get uranium to build a nuclear bomb. You also testified you had no involvement in the preparation of the fact sheet. And I have here, however, a timeline prepared the, by the State Department IG, and here's what it says. December 18, 18 2002, 8.30 a.m., at the Secretary, Secretary Powell's morning staff meeting, the Assistant Secretary of the, for the Bureau of Public Affairs and Department Spokesman asked the Under Secretary of Arms Control and International Security, you, for help in developing a response to I Iraq's December 7 declaration to the UN Security Council that could be used with the press. The Under Secretary Bolton agrees and tasks the Bureau of Nonproliferation. So according to the IG, your office subsequently reviewed multiple drafts of the facts sheet 
And I'd like to make this timeline part of the record of this hearing, Mr. Without Chairman. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, your testimony in response to my initial round of questions was that you had no involvement, but this IG review finds that you did. How can you explain this? The, uh, the question that was put to me uh, by Richard Boucher was, should this fact sheet be drafted by the Bureau of International Organization Affairs or the Bureau of Nonproliferation Affairs? And I suggested it be brief, it be prepared by the NP Bureau, uh, uh, which is, uh, I think, had greater uh, technical knowledge of what would be or what would not be in the Iraqi declaration. But that was a matter that. Uh, well, that wasn't the question I asked you. I asked you I whether no you were involved. In, I had no involvement uh, myself in the preparation of the fact sheet. Let me well, just say the gentleman's time's expired, but if some other member wants to yield in well, there. Well, could I minutes. just say one concluding no, no, comment? No, 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 Mr. Me, Chairman, you've been generous. No, no, I, just, will the gentleman just one, suspend a sec? I'm happy to have one of your other colleagues lend you their three minutes. I have no problem with Mr. that. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to make one uh, concluding comment. Okay, if that's all it is. It's astounding to me that you were in charge of this job, and you said before that you take the responsibility of being fully informed on matters that affect your duties. That's why you don't bother to read uh, the column that um, Mr. Cassidy Seymour Hirsch wrote. Seymour Hirsch wrote. But you're in, you're in charge of your own duties. Wouldn't when you're in charge of arms control and the biggest issue was whether we're going to go to war against Iraq on the issue of nuclear weapons, and you're charged with developing the fact sheet, and your people are charged, you're charged, and therefore your people develop the speech. Don't you think you have some responsibility to know what was going on? The, the speech was written uh, by and for Ambassador Negroponic. And as I say, at the staff level in the State Department, lots of things get cleared by lots of people. I don't clear all of ambassadors. I didn't clear, I believe, any of Ambassador Negroponte's speeches. And I think there are probably hundreds of people in the State Department today who don't clear any of my speeches well, that well, I give. Let me finish. Let me finish. I think, you're not accepting uh, responsibility uh, uh, for Mr. what's going on under Mr. your discretion. Mr. Mr. Waxman, you your said direction. you had one last point, and you're just going on. I'm happy to have someone else yield to you. If Mr. Kucinich wants to yield or Mr. Lynch, whatever. I'm, I'm Mr. Mr. Chairman, I made my point. We'll keep okay. strict tra track of the time you use as well. M but I, I may say, Congressman, I, I wish I could explain to you more comprehensively how the State Department works, because I think your questions reveal that perhaps you would benefit from that information. No, I, think it, I think my questions floor. are about what you did as the boss of the department that was supposed to be in charge of arms control, which was directly involved in the biggest issue of our time. Yeah, I, th I think the biggest disappointment war. the biggest disappointment to you, Congressman, is that I had no involvement. I'm sorry about that. Mr. Well, Kucinich, that is disappointing. I, I, <laughs> you didn't do your job. Well. Uh, Ambassador, I thank you for being here, and, and I thank the members for their questions. Mr. Kucinich, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you previously equated UN uh, uh, Article 51, the right of self-defense, with the doctrine of preemption. Uh, we know that Article 51 says that measures taken by members in the exercise of this right of self-defense shall be immediately reported to the Security Council. Has the U.S. notified the Security Council that the United States has begun uh, an operation against Iran? There's no notification uh, that's been given, but I, by saying that, I don't want to leave any implication that there's some operation that we haven't reported, because I think to the extent that's implied in your question, uh, it's inaccurate. Do you agree that the U.S. would have an obligation, as stated under Article 51, that if the U.S. had inserted uh, combat troops in Iran, or coordinated anti-Iranian insurgent groups like MEK to notify the Security Council? I, I'm, I'm not going to speculate on something that's entirely hypothetical. If the U.S. has troops in Iran, uh, would Iran be justified in invoking Article 51? I'm not going to speculate on that either. Uh, you can't, now, I want to get this straight for members of the committee. The ambassador can't comment about troops in Iran. He can't talk about troops in Iran or he has no knowledge of troops in Iran. And he calls uh, Mr. Hirsch's uh, article asserting troops in Iran fiction. Mr. Ambassador, which is it? Are there troops in Iran and you can't talk about it? Or are there not troops in Iran? I, I have no knowledge one way or the other of that subject, uh, nor is it appropriate. I work at the State Department, not the Defense Department. Ambassador Bolton, according to a report in the Guardian newspaper in early April, you told British parliamentarians that you believe military action 
could halt or at least set back the Iranian nuclear program. Are you confident that U.S. intelligence on Iran is comprehensive and sufficient to accurately target the Iranian nuclear program? Do we know where, how much, with certainty? The, the report was inaccurate. What report? You're the saying, you just you're saying this never to. happened? You never said that? That's correct. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Uh, does, are you confident that we have the information that we need to be able to uh, 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 ratchet up the conflict with Iran? Uh, I, I think that there are uh, many aspects of the Iranian nuclear weapons program and the Iranian ballistic missile program that we don't know about. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's something that uh, shouldn't give us comfort. It should increase our level of concern uh, about the uh, extent to which the Iranians have, in fact, uh, accomplished their efforts to master the entire nuclear fuel cycle and to derive and to develop uh, ballistic missile capability of longer and longer range and greater and greater accuracy. Uh, Gentlemen, are, you from, I, question. are you familiar with the report that uh, Iranians captured dissident forces who confessed to working with U.S. troops in Iran. Do you, do, do you have, have you had any discussions with anyone about the presence of U.S. troops in Iran? Have you heard any complaints about it? Has anybody asked you about it? Do you have any interest in it? Uh, I have, I certainly have interest in it with respect That's to every other question you've asked. I've only heard it from you today. Mr. Lynch has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I, I just want to go over a distinction that, that we've had here today in this discussion. Uh, I, as I said before, you did make it very clear that you had no involvement in, in drafting the speech or in the fact sheet uh, for Mr. Negroponte. Uh, however, as, as uh, Ranking Member Waxman pointed out, uh, there is a State Department IG memo that indicates that uh, uh, that you tasked your staff, the Bureau of Nonproliferation, to participate in the preparation. So is the distinction here that, that you didn't do it personally, but that your staff, staff actually helped with the, the fact sheet or the, the remarks uh, by Mr. Negroponte? Yeah, if I, I could make two comments on that. Number one, uh, I don't think I actually followed through and asked the Nonproliferation Bureau to do that. I think ultimately the Bureau of Public Affairs asked them to do it. Second, uh, in terms of the uh, relationship between undersecretaries and bureaus at the State Department, the, the four assistant secretaries that reported to me also reported directly to the secretary and the deputy secretary. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't in any way call them my office. They were independent bureaus that had their own reporting chain to the secretary. They were under my uh, general supervision, but as is the case with all undersecretaries, and this may be a, a striking comment on the management of the State Department, but, uh, but I never considered those bureaus my office. In any event, I didn't see the fact sheet until okay. uh, well, uh, well after it was prepared. I, I have limited time. And it was so, a fact sheet for sir, the press. Sir, I, I have limited time. I think you've, you've answered. Uh, so even there, under your supervision, for all intents and purposes, you're saying that they weren't under your control and that that this was done without your This was your a staff. Yeah, Do you see the irony here, Mr. Ambassador? Do you see the irony here? We're trying to induce accountability with the UN. We're trying to tell Kofi Annan to get his act together and to take responsibility and, and to be accountable. And yet, here we are on this merry-go-round about you have people under your supervision, but they're not under your control. and, and uh, it's just under under circumstances that would require very close scrutiny and, and, and supervision. This is a an issue of major U.S. policy. No, it's and, the preparation and, sir, of a fact sheet, Congressman, is not a major issue of U.S. policy. This was a staff level function done. When to we're prepare. making a decision whether or not to go to no, war because Senate a foreign country because really. Iraq is trying to acquire. Uh, nuclear weapons, that, that is a major issue. Mr. That is a major Mr. issue. Mr. Ben Holland, this was Mr. Ben not, Holland, this you was not a policy issue of any significance. It was the preparation of a fact sheet to hand to the press about the Iraqi declaration of their weapons. They were trying to prepare.
Gentlemen, we were trying to persuade expired. the Congress to Mr. approve the War Powers Act. Mr. That's ben, what this is about. Mr. Van Hollen, if, if you would uh, take the floor. Mr. Uh, Ambassador, Mr. Van Hollen will have three minutes. I'll have three minutes, and thank you for spending so much time with us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And I would just point out that fact sheet was the, the first time where the United States publicly made the claim that uh, Iraq was seeking uh, uranium from I, I thought you actually said a moment ago, or maybe Mr. Kucinich did, that the fact sheet was based on Ambassador no. Negroponte's statement. I, mis uh, first of all, mis Mr. Ambassador, I did not say that. Mm. I don't know who said that, but I did not say that. Now, my question to you, if I could just get back to my earlier question, with respect to the President's statement, where he acknowledged that the fact that we didn't find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq created some credibility issues with respect to claims the United States has made with their intelligence. Yes or no, have you seen any evidence of that in your discussions with your, your colleagues at the United Nations? I think, I think some people have raised it. I think there's some of the same people who would object to doing what's necessary on Iran in any case. And I would say that, in fact, most of the information that is uh, under consideration before the Security Council now on Iran uh, has been disclosed in publicly available reports from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Okay. Well, let me just ask the question that I raised in my opening statement. If we're not successful, I hope we're successful in getting the Security Council to take actions uh, and impose economic sanctions uh, against Iran. If we're not successful at getting the UN Security Council to do that, how successful could we be? Would we be able to exert any leverage if you put together a group of nations outside uh, UN Security Council action to take economic, impose economic sanctions against Iran, or is that really not, not a, a non-starter? No, I, I think that would be critical if we, if uh, when we get to the point of uh, trying to have the Council adopt targeted sanctions against uh, Iran, if we were not uh, successful in getting the extent and scope of the sanctions that we wanted. Uh, if we were faced with a veto by one of the permanent members, if for whatever reason the Council couldn't fulfill its responsibilities, then I think uh, it would be incumbent on us, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sure we would press ahead to ask other countries or other groups of countries to impose those sanctions, because the, uh, for one thing, the uh, Iranians have been very effective at deploying their oil and natural gas resources to apply leverage uh, against countries to protect themselves uh, from precisely this kind of pressure. In the case of countries with large and growing energy demands like India, China, and Japan, the Iranians are trying to induce them to make extensive capital investments, such as Japan and the Azadegan oil field, uh, that would make it very difficult for those countries or other countries similarly situated to, uh, to do what they otherwise would do on a, on a major proliferation question. Right. And with respect to Sudan, if we're unable to get the Security Council to take further actions against Sudan, I, I was glad you, they took the action they did against the four uh, Sudanese government uh, officials. But if we're not able to get the Security Council to take other collective action against uh, Sudan, whatever form uh, it may take, uh, to what extent is the United States going to work to put together a coalition of nations that would do so? Well, I think that's certainly something we have to look at. We have, we have relied at the uh, request of the African Union and I think the overwhelming international opinion, we have relied on the mediation efforts of uh, Salim Salim in Abuja uh, to try and work out a peace agreement uh, among the government of uh, the Sudan, the uh, three major rebel groups and others. Now that uh, target date for the completion of the Abuja agreement was uh, Sunday, April the 30th. And I think, as everybody knows, it's been extended for a couple days. Deputy Secretary Zelik has flown out there. Uh, it, looks to, uh, it, it looks to be in difficult straits, but, but we'll have to see what happens. And I think the, uh, the question of what we do next um, is, uh, is in part dependent on the outcome. And I just I don't want to give you an overly long answer, but you know there are three possible outcomes to Abuja. One is a peace agreement that the parties comply with fully. The second is a peace agreement that most comply with, but some do not. And the third is uh, either uh, no agreement or an agreement that everybody signs and nobody complies with. The circumstances of what we would do in terms of the UN peacekeeping mission in Darfur and the uh, delivery of humanitarian assistance depend critically on which environment we're talking about. So. Uh, we've been pushing the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations to do contingency planning for all of those potential outcomes so that whichever it turns out to be, uh, 
uh, were not slowed down in our efforts to effect a transition, a rapid transition between the African Union mission in Darfur and the UN mission we expect to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to claim my, uh, my time and just to, um, one, uh, to thank you, Ambassador Bolton. Ambassador, um, you described the dysfunction of the UN before anyone else did. Uh, now I think most people recognize it. You've been tremendously criticized over the years for doing that. I want to just say, as one member of Congress, I appreciated you're just being straightforward. And the irony is now that you want to reform the UN, some people are saying you want to destroy it. Uh, you know, you want the system to work properly. And we've had a golden opportunity to which I think we've used some of it well to understand the significance as it relates to Iran and the Sudan. If people don't want military force to be used, you've got to be able to depend on sanctions. And I'm struck by the fact, though, that you can never take off the table military uh, force. I wish President um, Carter had not said, we will not use military force to have Iran uh, free the diplomats it took as hostage. What an outrage to have taken diplomats. They must have said, America, what a country. Uh, I, the bottom line is you had, President, um, you had President Reagan come in and just say the truth, something you might have said. He said, taking diplomats is an act of war and we will treat it as such. He didn't say what he would do and the diplomats were returned. I happen to believe um, uh, the Libyan president uh, saw what happened to Saddam and said, you know what, uh, I like diplomacy. But he knew behind there was uh, the potential that he could have been replaced. So I happen to believe you can never take off the table your military force. If Saddam ever thought we would get him out of Kuwait, he never would have gone in. And I believe if he ever believed that we would remove him from power, he would gladly be in the Riviera with his billions of dollars. But, but he didn't believe it because the French and the Russians and others told him we weren't coming in. That's the tragedy of it. So I understand why you're reluctant to say, you know, force is on the table. But you're the diplomat, but I hope we back up your diplomacy with strong uh, the potential uh, to have people realize, particularly the Europeans, if you're not going to go along with sanctions, what do you leave as the end result? And then to know, my God, they get the weapon. They get a, a nuclear weapon, then I'm pretty sure that uh, you'll have Saudi Arabia and others say the same thing. So this is a huge issue. I wish we had focused a little more on that aspect of this because that's the bottom line for me. I have people who marched in my office uh, very concerned about what's happened in Sudan. But if, if, uh, if Khartoum does not believe that there's going to be action taken against them, I don't know how diplomacy works. And I guess what I'd love is for you just to tell me, uh, in concluding, with Iran and with uh, the Sudan, you are working diplomatically to get an agreement. Do you feel that you are making headway? Do you feel that you are uh, just kind of in never, never land right now? Where are we at? Well, I think both in the case of Iran and uh, really in the case of uh, Darfur as well, that these constitute uh, tests for the Security Council. Uh, in the case of Iran, this is a perfect storm of a country that for decades has been the leading state financier of terrorism, the, one of the leading state sponsors of terrorism in, in the world, uh, providing funds and, uh, and equipment and weapons to groups like Hamas and Hezbollah and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Uh, at the same time, a government that now seeks to acquire nuclear weapons and advanced ballistic missile capabilities, a country led by uh, a president who denies the existence of the Holocaust, uh, calls on Israel to be wiped off the map, uh, who held a seminar uh, last year called The World Without the United States. This is not a man you want to have with his finger on the nuclear button uh, or with the capability of delivering nuclear weapons to terrorist groups that could transport them around the world. So if you believe, as we do, that terrorism and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction are the two greatest threats to international peace and security that, that we face, this is a test for the Security Council to deal with Iran and to uh, bring an end to its nuclear weapons program. In the Sudan, uh, you have a government that uh, uh, is, uh, has, been, has been responsible over the years for uh, the deaths of more than two million of its citizens in the southern part of Sudan. That 
now subject of a comprehensive peace agreement we hope will hold, but having engaged in uh, genocide and, uh, and uh, murder and uh, causing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to have to leave their home in the Darfur region, uh, that has put off the Security Council in ways large and small. A couple of weeks ago, they refused, the government of Khartoum refused to give visas to four military planners from the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations so they could get onto the ground in Darfur to do the kind of uh, kicking of tires and, and looking at the terrain and everything that would help facilitate planning. Uh, so, so far, the, uh, the government has been able to withstand our efforts there. We'll see if the sanctions that we recently imposed and other ones that may come uh, might have an influence on their thinking, that the Security Council, in many respects, the same problem we faced in other situations. Is the Security Council serious about its resolutions or is it not? That's the test in Sudan. Well, I thank you very much for being here. It's, uh, you've been very responsive, I think. And uh, we appreciate, I appreciate uh, deeply the work you do as our ambassador. We're going to have a five-minute recess and then convene with our second panel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.